Good evening, and welcome to this gallery opening. Um, the, for many years, the name Richard Brower was synonymous with visual art in Northwest Indiana. Professor Brower taught art, he was chair of the department, he was a curator of the university's collection, and finally director of the gallery uh, until his retirement about 10 or 11 years ago. And since his retirement, the university saw fit to name the gallery after Professor Brower, and it is now the Brower Museum of Art at Valparaiso University. Uh, we're delighted to welcome uh, Richard Brower here to Trinity for his first visit on campus. Um, and I would uh, direct you up here. We have a, uh, an artist statement on the table and also a price list for those pieces that are available for sale. Uh, and I would say that in addition to our professional relationship, I, I'm a collector of Richard's work, and we've been friends for many years, and it's my pleasure to welcome him and his wife, Ellen, to Trinity Christian College. Please join me. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. It's just a delight to be here. You have a beautiful gallery, and I've never seen my work looking any better <laughs> anywhere. Uh, I can just, uh, I understand better what, uh, when someone says modern art is museum art, because there's nothing like a, a beautiful space, well-lighted, to, uh, to help you really contemplate works of art. And uh, I understand this is just new here at Trinity Christian College, and I bet you, you uh, love this space. I'm sure you do. I also want to say thank you to Marcy for installing this show. It's not easy to get them lined up and, uh, and to get the lights on them and to put up a, frame, uh, a painting that doesn't have a frame. And, uh, and so I'm just, I'm just really pleased uh, and uh, delighted about everything uh, and all the arrangements here at Trinity Christian College. I also want to thank you for coming. Uh, you, uh, it's a delight for me that you're here and an honor to me. So uh, I, will, I will proceed to make a few remarks and, uh, and then uh, go around the gallery and talk about uh, a little bit more directly about what's on the wall and why I went around, wh why I uh, worked on these. And uh, of course, questions are welcome anytime. I have this marvelous microphone, so even though I've learned Chinese, I think you can hear me. I can hear myself. I understand, I understand you are uh, art students, is that right? Uh, from any particular class? A lot of different classes. Ah, well great. Um, some, one of these days, I think I'd like to see some of the art studios here because uh, I've been just told that they are fantastic. So, wonderful. Now you're lucky in some ways because when I made my last draft of this, I omitted a page or two, so you don't have to hear some of this. <laughs> and we'll, <coughs> we'll wing it. But in, in just a, a few words of the introduction, uh, let me say these, this. The pop artist Klaus Oldenburg once wrote, art is like the cane of a blind man, tap, tap, tapping, to find out what the world is like. In some ways, his imagery is apt. Unexamined by art or by other devices, life remains vague, shadowy, and seems to pass us by. But in other ways, his imagery falls short. To examine life with the tool of art is to examine life with one's whole being. A sign I saw at an art fair sums up well art's total involvement. The laborer works with his hands. 
The craftsman works with his hands and his head. And the artist works with his hands, his head, and his heart. In other words, art has the power to engage a person's sensibility, thoughts, and feelings, one's full humanity, in one unified experience. Through the ages, these powers of art have been used to illuminate and enhance the experience of living. Now, from my point of view of a Christian, if art has the power to illuminate, enhance, and enhance life in that way, I believe it has the power to do that for Christian life as well. These cross images are my tap, tap, tappings to probe for increased awareness of Christ our Redeemer and of the redeemed life in the Lord. Let me read a little bit from the artist's statement. Baptized, and this is a little biographical now, baptized as an infant that is sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever, which is the way they say it in our church, brought up by devout parents in a very large German Lutheran committee community, I as a youth and young adult training to become an artist wondered why most art expressions of faith seem borrowed from another time. I was struggling to make my faith my own, not borrowed. Throughout my career in commercial art, personal art, art teaching, and in an art museum, I tried to find or use especially the visual language of our modern era to express aspects of the Christian faith. One of the main features of modernism was the power of forms and colors to speak with great immediacy on their own outside of any service to depicting anything. And I thought that was a great, great strength. In the, in the late 50s, I created a series of prints and paintings uh, on the idea of creation. I felt if I could find a way to express with the impact of modernism the ideas that our God and the God as described by Christians was the God that created this earth, this world, that would be a goal. And I, and I tried to do that. And then in the 60s, I became interested in seeing what I could do about the idea of redemption. How I could make it explicit. How I could... See, you have a vague notion when you start something. And uh, I became interested then in the equal-armed cross as a shape on which to paint and draw designs that fuse with the cross to form sim modern symbols of Christ and the Christian life. Paintings on shaped canvases had recently been created by acclaimed modernist Frank Stella. Maybe you know of him. Especially the early Frank Stella. Who without symbolic intent, and he disclaimed anything like that. What you see is what you see. without symbolic intent, had been painting flat geometric systems on irregularly shaped canvases. You can see one huge one at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I, made a, I wrote an article about that. At any rate, I thought, why can't a person have symbolic intentions? If he can paint on shaped canvases, I can paint on shaped canvases. And the shape could be a cross. Why not? 
You don't have to paint just on a rectangular shape. What if you paint on a shape of a cross? Well, luckily I was working for an academic institution and in the 19th, I mean my day job was a lot of things, but not painting. <laughs> So I had to make time. I was married and had a growing family and you know all those things. In the 1970s, I was enabled by a Valparaiso University Creative Research Grant, an Alumni Faculty Fellowship Award, and a sabbatical leave to create most of the crosses in this exhibit. It was really two campaigns, the early 70s and the paintings on canvas or on paper, at least over here, they were done in that first campaign and some of the drawings. The paintings in the second campaign were 3D. They were, you know, Stella painted his shaped canvases uh, with stretchers that were at least two inches thick. So they were kind of objects, reliefs on the wall, and yet they were paintings. So it was somewhere in between. And so there are, you can see here, there's a thickness here. And I wanted to, I mean the cross is a symbol of the crucifixion. And uh, I tried to, I thought the outside edges should be black. All them, I just, felt I wanted to do that. And uh, even here, if you look at it from the side, the center is black. Uh, and I guess I painted this black as well. Now, <clears throat> I was doing some readings about the cross. Well, let me read you this other paragraph here. As an archetype of wholeness. Now that's what I call this kind of cross. It's vertically and horizontally symmetrical. So this, uh, this arm is as big as that arm. That arm is as big as this arm. It's centered. Now the Latin cross, this stem is longer. And as I say, well, the Latin cross uh, is a little closer to depicting a cross on which Christ died. And so you think of it as more of a cross in which the sorrows are, are referred to. At any rate, as an archetype of wholeness, the vertically and horizontally symmetric cross, having four equal length arms, provides an arresting complex unity, richly layered in symbolic meanings. At one level, this cross works as a plus sign and as a four-way intersection road sign. In some ways, I like the idea of an intersection road sign. There is a collision coming. At another, psychologist C.G. Jung, in his 1951 essay, Christ is symbol of the self, des describes the tense unity of opposing cross arms as symbolizing the psychological self, reconciling such, as he said, irreconcilable opposites as good versus evil, spiritual versus material. And he goes on with opposites. Somehow this holds together things that really don't belong together. All right, religiously the crux quadrata, which is way it's said sometimes, is universally recognized as a primary symbol of the redemptive death of Christ as well as signifying Christ's church and disciples. The uh, 
at the church I go to, Emmanuel Lutheran, they use this cross proportion, or this Greek cross, as the main cross on the steeple of the church. And you will find that oftentimes the, uh, this uh, Greek cross is used to, uh, as a symbol of disciples and of, well, not so much the passion of Christ, but the church of Christ, the disciples of Christ. So, I just, uh, I thought this has uh, rich possibilities. And, and I was thinking, well, what would happen if the cross were just very, very stubby and compact, very, almost just emerging, just emerging from the center? You see how short that is. This is a little bit longer, but it's just a third of the entire length. This one doesn't, doesn't fit in. It was the first one I made, 1971, and I didn't have my master plan. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know if I ever showed it before. I had it framed badly very close so that these empty spaces got to be very important. And that wasn't supposed to be. And so I had it reframed and in the process I thought, I won't use a rectangle, I'll use the octagon, which sometimes you can see used. And the octagon is the eighth it has the meaning in the Christian church as the eighth day of creation. As, uh, and since I wanted the, the cross to somehow convey a sense of new life, I thought the eighth day of creation, which is the day of renewal for all of creation, uh, would, be, would work. And you have to, I don't know, does it work for you? But it's the only one I tried that way. So, let me get back to the point. The crosses in this exhibit were inspired by the major times of the church year. The time of Advent Christmas Epiphany with its meditations on Christ's incarnation inspired the just emerging short wide-armed, revealing crosses. I think of these crosses as symbols of Christ coming into the world. All right. The one that is mostly a symbol of Christ is this one. And you can see that this one and that one, which I did last December, and that one, which I did in the early 80s, I'm embarrassed that it took so long to really... But this one uh, follows uh, Revelations 22, verse 16, where Christ says, it's one of the last chapters, elapsed chapters in the Bible, when Christ says, I am the bright morning star. And I think, ah, isn't that wonderful? How can I do that? How can I uh, suggest it? You know, they say it's dark as just before it gets light and there's the bright morning star. And it says something wonderful is coming into this world. And uh, so I, I think this is the first one I did this way. I thought, well, I'm going to have a cross in which all the arms are the same in the center. But I desperately didn't want static crosses. I wanted some movement and tension, and so I made this into a labyrinth. And if you look closely, this goes out and around and around, and while this is in the center, you don't the number of 
reverberations around it vary somewhat. You can see that here. And uh, sometimes the, the colors change a little bit. There's more grays down here than up there. But for the most part, these are, are pretty much an image of Christ. I am the bright morning star. And this has gold in the middle. And that one has silver in the middle. And I guess I think of this as Advent. <laughs> and this as Epiphany, where the star led the wise men, you might say. So that's kind of the, th the variations. I was going to do another one on paper uh, to try something different. And I never got around to it. So these, uh, uh, this one also is an early one, 1974. And you can see that this is the only one that I tried to do some representation in. I mean, some people look at this and they see, and in my mind, that these were our berries or seeds. And look at it to see how I made it spiral. Does it work that way for you? Uh, what about shadings in the background? This is one of the only ones I shaded. Okay. Now, over here is a little, uh, this is part of a pr pr processional cross that was made to fit into a painting that's at Emmanuel Church. And then they, um, they don't use that painting anymore, <laughs> so they don't use this anymore, and they allowed me to borrow this. Uh, and the proportions of this were based on the shape of the opening in the canvas. So there was a lot of now, I, was, I, was, I wanted to uh, do something for Epiphany where uh, Christ's divinity is exposed or revealed. These are all revealing crosses. Uh, this kind of reveals that Christ has come to, give, uh, to uh, redeem all of nature as well as human, humanity. And, but here... I used a center, I just drew it out. I like parallel lines. I drew it out so that that center has a certain sense of power. Now I know s since doing that, there is a, a tendency for churches not to want to show God's power so much that we, we pray to God the Father and we often have the Father visualized as an open hand. And that's good, but I wanted to suggest power there. And I never got to really do any painting like that. Now, let's see. The other one. The time of a, a Lent Easter with its meditations on Christ's life, death, and resurrection inspired the medium armed, somewhat literal, transforming crosses with their left and bottom arms, usually darker than their top and right arms. Now, so there is going to be a change here from, there's going to be a change in the cross form, in the image. Um, we have a big crucifix in our chapel at the university um, in which there uh, there's a big figure of Christ, raised gold, and the hands are up. And the cross behind it, it's lifting itself up off the cross. Just below in the chapel of the rest, in the Gloria Christi chapel, is another crucifix. And the figure of Christ is by the same sculptor, David Elder, way out in, West, in California now. And it is... Uh, the figure is writhing in agony. And I think, and nobody, nobody likes to look at it. It is so hard um, to convey uh, the resurrection or the whole process of from death to
to resurrection in one image. We have a Santos from New Mexico in our museum collection in which the figure, the, the dead figure, has the head leaning over to the side. And behind, painted on the crossing, is a rose on a black background. It looks very Spanish. But there is that element of hope just in that one figure. Well, I wanted to get this idea of death and resurrection somehow into one image. So here I have one half dark and one half light. And I have the stripes going across. I have one red paint color that goes from the black to the white. And I do that for the green and so on. And I call it breakthrough, and I'm not sure that's the best name for it. But there is something about, I think, in my mind, a feeling that there is the presence of, of a loving Savior, regardless of your troubles, in your joys, and in your sorrows. There's a continuity there. But you know, beyond that, I just like it. For I, I, just, I just, I don't know if I'll ever want to sell it because I just like it, and I can't explain it. Now, this is the one that I try to do death and resurrection the strongest. It's just a drawing. But you can see that the left and the right side are black with white thin lines, and the other ones are outlined. All the lines are outlined. And to my mind, there seems to be a release it's, it's at a diagonal, and there's the diagonal that's created from the corners. And I tried to do that in a painting. And you can see the same color paint just pervades, but then I kind of changed that here. And here you can see the bottom and the left, or it's really the darkest is at the bottom, and the top half is the lighter half. And I call this, uh, what do I call it? Resolution. But there is a kind of change from a kind of brooding darkness. Well, I don't know if it's brooding. You decide. Now you can see that sometimes the paint gets very, very thick. That's because I changed my mind again and again and again. And it got thicker and thicker and thicker. <laughs> now this one, I've had people remark about it, but I remember I was on sabbatical leave in New Mexico, and I was on a makeshift table made out of an old door on all that, and I was working away, and we had just gone to some Pueblo. Uh, there was a corn dance we saw, and there was a very... Uh, and I just, in my own mind, I don't know if it translates to anybody else. I just thought, oh, there are so many different Christian groups. And they are, there, are, uh, there are some that are really mainstream. There are some that just follow their own way. And there are some that are just hardly organized. And there are some that are just individuals. And that's, that's why I did it. And I liked the way it looked. Whether that means that to you or not, it doesn't matter. But within, I'm just telling you the process I followed. <laughs> and uh, take it or leave it. Uh, and this, gets, this introduces a, more of a diagonal. Uh, I call this centering. And it just seems that if we, uh, you never know what sparks fly when you stay centered. And so it's kind of a pinwheel effect. And uh, with this beautiful lighting, I can see some of the uh, closer changes in color 
that I so painstakingly painted in and never see at home at all. And, and this as well. But you see, there is, there is this kind of somber quality by painting the sides black. All right. There is that introduction of the diagonal. And so in this gallery, we, pr we proceed. And, and, and I find myself saying, well, what if I use diagonal lines more in the crosses? Uh, and some of these, I, and I begin to think of Pentecost and the gifts of the Spirit and how it it uh, can come in a very uh, kind of maybe unbidden sometimes. And I think of op art. That's what I was thinking. You know, Bridget Riley, are you acquainted with Bridget Riley's work? She's of a different generation. Uh, but she's an Irish lady and makes absolutely stunning op art. Things just tremor sometimes. In other words, op art affects your eyes in ways you cannot control. There is a uh, there is a uh, a shimmer of col of opposite colors, of wavy lines, of uh, breaks in it, where the surface is always alive, uh, but never at rest. I don't know if you ever done any op art. And, uh, and I thought, wow, sometimes the gifts of the Spirit, let's say at Pentecost, just overwhelm. I don't know. This one is the real challenge. Uh, I call it conflict. I thought, I'm going to make opposites. I'm going to get this, op you know, what's the opposite of blue? Orange. What's the opposite of yellow? purple. What if I tilted it all? And I challenge, it's like camouflage. I want to challenge the cross. Well, that's the idea of it. So, then over here. Now, at the time of the, of, uh, after Pentecost, you know, at church, you got most of the summer and most of the fall, and you, you go to church and you reflect on the Christian life. And so I think of these as uh, images of life in the Lord. You know, it, uh, some t I don't know if you do it, but we do it in the morning when we have our devotions. We follow Martin Luther's morning prayer, and we start with the sign of the cross. So I'm marked with the sign of the cross. I got to live that way. And I think it's a good way to live. I think of it as the good life. And try as I might, even in this, I couldn't make these sad. I just couldn't make them sad. And so I call this one, using some of the op art diagonals, and not letting it cross in the middle, I call it joy. Life in the Lord, joy. I don't know what I call this. <laughs> <laughs> then I wanted to get one that was peaceful. Really peaceful. And what happened is that have you ever tried to make colors eh, all the same grayness? So I have, I have a hue. It's very hard to do. And uh, so I've got a hue and a gray that I like to think are just very close. And all the way along. And so it takes good light. It's all the same, except the hues pop out. And I think, hmm. Well, what kind of a life in the Lord is that? Maybe it's for preschoolers. 
or infants or something like that. And this one, I, I, I thought, well, I'm going to make the background black and see what would happen with that because I don't have the sides black. It's not black. And, uh, and I try to have so more somber colors, and I do call it grief. But I'm not sure if that's a good name. Uh, now notice also that over here I have the cross arm, oh, about half an inch. And now these get a little thinner. This is about, it gets a little picky, but these are maybe three eighths. And these are a quarter of an inch. And they look very long. And you know, I, in my own mind, just to, to point out what I was thinking, I remember Giacometti's figures. Have you, you know the sculptor Giacometti? And how elongated those figures are. They're very thin, very long, and the surfaces are very sharp and textured and irregular. And there's a kind of sense that they're stretched almost to the breaking point. But they're held together anyway. And there's something about uh, these crosses that I wanted to uh, suggest that there is a tension in that it's a difficult unity to put your material and your spiritual selves together the good and the bad in yourself and hold it in one in one life in the Lord and so I didn't want to make it too easy but I did want it to make it look like it was good. And so I've got, this is uh, someone who picked this out. I, one time a person came and said, uh, I want to buy one of these uh, and wanted me to pick it out for her. And I said, no, 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 you pick it out. And she picked out this. And I'm just wondering why. And I think it's a very even effect with some of the, Yellow's in there, kind of golden. And, and that's it. And then these, it just seems to me that these two are just showing some of the fullness in Christ that a life in the Lord might be. The red has a certain strength, kind of ending in greens and gold gold lines in it. And this is a, just another, another image of, uh, of the yellows as though it's growth. Uh, and uh, I guess I have come into a room I kind of unexpectedly seeing one of my crosses on there and I thought, oh, that's good. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? But I, I just think it makes it a very nice, uh, upbeat feel. There's one more cross here that maybe I should discuss. And that's this one. It, I call it an activating cross. See, I, I call those that are, are uh, the, uh, crosses of discipleship. I call them activating crosses, activated by gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I do call this an activating cross too, but it doesn't have the diagonal lines. And it looks very static because the greens are the same. All the colors are the same. But what I want to do, I call it cross section. What I wanted to do was to make that center like the sap, like the spark, like the energy. And I wanted it to radiate from the center to the outside. And this hung in a church for a while, and I painted both sides the same. That's why here you can see it on the outside as well as on the inside. Well, there you go. I don't have anything more to say. 
Do you, do you have any questions to ask? <laughs> I, I just want to also say, please, it might sound very pat. All this says this and this and this. It's just in my mind. The way you see it might be le uh, legitimately different. Okay. Thank you so much for attending. We have some refreshment outside of the gallery. Please help yourself. And then feel free to come back in and examine any of the crosses and so forth. And Professor Bowles is here the next half hour, hour, or so forth, if you have questions or would like to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>